There we go. So stabilizing flexion involves an equilibrium. The equilibrium is going to be denoted as a P hat. So P prime, next generation. P hat, equilibrium. P bar, average. So interpretation of what the symbols mean, or at least the little modifications, is kind of important. We typically actually see stabilizing selection around a handful of things. It's somewhat true about height. We don't see freakishly tall people. We don't see freakishly short people. We're all kind of, sort of, in the same-ish range. There's actually evidently some statistics that correlate if you wish to live to be your, in your hundreds, you need to be under six feet tall. People who are over six feet tall typically do not make it that far. So if you want longevity, shorter is better. We also see this with birth weights, really heavy children. If you don't happen to have modern techniques where we can cut the kid out, uh, is stuck and then kid dies and then mom dies, so that's fun. And if you're born too light, you're not gonna survive. So we have a range that seems to be somewhat decent. We can calculate the equilibrium value for P, and it is strictly based upon fitness values. Allele frequencies have nothing to do with the equilibrium. We will see this typically with overdominance. There's no real equilibrium with directional selection, and the reason why is you keep pushing. Because one allele is better than the others. We also don't really get an equilibrium with underdominance, which we'll deal with in a moment. And the reason why is the equilibrium you count you calculate. is fragile, meaning you can actually calculate an equilibrium, but in real life, if anything disturbs it, it cracks in half, and it's gone. So with that said, we should probably talk about what we mean by overdominance and underdominance. Overdominance is when the heterozygote wins. So the fitness value of the heterozygote is greater than either recessive or either homozygote. The most famous of all these, of course, is sickle cell, which is why let's go for the low-hanging fruit. So the heterozygote is more fit than the homozygotes because if you are in an area where malaria is endemic, what you need to worry about is not having sickle cell disease because that's going to kill you. But you also don't want malaria, because that's going to kill you. So of the three choices, for the sake of just using A's for this, one version is no sickle cell disease, but malaria is going to kill you. The other one, you have sickle cell disease, and that's going to kill you. But there's no malaria. If you're a heterozygote, unless you put yourself into extreme low oxygen situations, you're not going to have sickle cell disease, and you're immune from malaria. So under both sets of conditions, you win. Which means in areas where we see malaria and this trait is an option, you'll have a high degree of heterozygosity. Meaning, there's a lot of heterozygotes. The reason why? They're more fit than everyone else. The other option is if it's not overdominance where the heterozygote wins, then it must be underdominance. Underdominance is when the heterozygote is less fit. And if it's not done correctly, 
this is going to lead to disruptive selection. If it's unstable. So the famous example that works with this one is the RH factor. That's the plus or minus when you talk about your blood type. There's a condition referred to as the hemolytic disease of the newborn. Everyone is fair game for it. It's just a matter of your birth order. The, or, the way that this turns out to work is you have to have the mom who is RH negative. doesn't matter if she's A, B, A, B, O. That, that's irrelevant. It's minus, minus. She has to be A negative or B negative or whatever. The dad needs to be positive. One of the possibilities is this child, their first child, will be heterozygous. When that happens, one of the things that occurs, this is with baby number one, is there's like bleeding and stuff when childbirth happens. And you get a swapping of blood between the baby and the mother. So blood does get exchanged. So if some of this baby's RH positive blood gets inside of the mother, the mother's body will detect this strange foreign protein, say, what is this? and mount an immune response. It's irrelevant because the baby's now popped out. So who cares? Catches with your immune system is you remember it. You remember every, anything that has ever offended your immune system, any antigen. So baby number two shows up. So your second baby is going to be okay. If your second baby is RH positive. It's not the first, it's the second after a positive child. So if you have RH negative baby, RH negative baby, RH negative baby, RH negative baby, doesn't apply to any of them. Child number five is RH positive. Now we start worrying after that. What will then happen is right before birth, you have, or when you're born, you have no immune system. It's none of it's functional. All you've done is train your immune system to say, this is what you don't kill. So what the mother does is she's going to give a big boost of antibodies. She's going to actually do this twice. Once, right through the placenta, the other time through breast milk. So for that first burst, she's going to give her newborn child, or soon to be newborn child, all of her antibodies to help give it a little bit of a boost. The catch is, the kid's older sibling gave her a reason to attack RH positive blood, which means that mom is going to give an anti RH factor to this newborn baby and it will kill the baby. That is why it's referred to as the hemolytic disease of the newborn. You're going to attack the red blood cells and the way you will do that or at least the way our body attacks things, is we blow stuff up. That's why we like boom booms and fireworks and stuff. That's not true, but whatever. So the mom is going to kill her newborn child. Because of this, and if we get outside of modern medicine, we typically find people who are homozygous for RH, either plus plus, or your minus minus, because historically the blending can be dangerous, but it only applies if the mom is negative. The mom is positive doesn't mean anything, but the mom's RH negative, this is an issue. Nowadays, you get tested, and if it's child number one, okay, they'll tell you about it, like, okay, here's what we're gonna have to do if you have to worry about other kids. So, they just suppress the mom's immune system. So they, they work around it. But that's nowadays. Historically, that's not true. Okay, so let's do some of the math problems. 
So for Drosophila, they have an inverted chromosome that is either a standard or a Kirikawa. In a population of flies, the ST flies, standard flies, have an 89% survival. The other type is 41%. But the mixed flies are 100% surviving. Calculate the equilibrium value for P. Don't we need fitness values? Fitness is about survival. The fitness value for ST is 0.89. The fitness for CH is 0.41. The fitness for the heterozygote is 1. So you don't need to be told explicitly what the fitness values are. We can infer them from the problem. So to do the calculation, we have p hat equals that fun formula. Again, on the final, I will give you the formulas. Don't waste them on your cheat sheet. We just plug numbers in. So 1 minus 0.41. We'll have 2 minus 0.89 minus 0.41. Plug all that in, you're going to get 0.84. Why would it be 0.84? Because the standard one is more fit than this recessive version, so we would expect the equilibrium to be closer to the more fit allele. How do I know that this is the formula to apply? Because the fitness value for the heterozygote, the mixed fly, is greater than those two. That's the giveaway as to what formula to use. How would this change if uh, we just rearrange the components? So standard fly, CH, and then the heterozygote. Well, if you were to do that, let's just plug numbers in. Heterozygote is 0 0.6. This is 0.4. And we'll go 2 times 0 0.6 minus 0 0.8 minus 0.4. That gets me 0 0.2 divided by... You know, you divide by zero. I know calculus has given us tricks around that problem, but this ain't no calculus class. So what this tells me is there's no such equilibrium. How do I know? because the fitness of the homozygote was greater than the others. We were flat out being told this is not an equilibrium problem. This is directional selection. So if you do the problem and you end up doing a divide by zero, congratulations, wrong formula. It's a big giveaway that you're heading the wrong direction. Of course, correct. So at least that's nice. If you were to repeat this calculation for making the, he the heterozygote the least, so make it so like this, take these two and flip-flop them, you will actually end up calculating a p-value, just so you know. But keep in mind that that p-value is an unstable p-value, so you'll get an equilibrium. It's just not, in real life, something that sticks around. Last bit, sexual selection. Did any of you watch your homework? The one I described to have you go watch? Do you remember what it was? 
Yeah, the, the TV show. Don't worry, it's only an hour. It, you can only watch it at night. You have to watch it at night. During daytime? No, that's not scary. You have to watch it at night. So non-random mating occurs because there's something else going on. There's a preference in with whom you reproduce. It's not going to be what plants experience. Well, kind of what plants experience. If you were sea sponges, you just shoot sperm and egg into the water column and you just hope for the best. But even then, there's still some of this that's going on. Reason why is there are always some type of preference. We can do it based upon if there's a caste system that exists. Not that humans do this in any way, shape, or form. It could be based upon you're trapped in a location and you can only reproduce with who's in your location. It could be based upon a bias in what traits they have, either good bias or negative bias. Humans turn out to do this one quite a bit, and some of it is subconscious. We also do it off of convenience, like family. So that's fun. So the first example we're going to go through is called assortative mating. So assortative mating is based upon traits and, to a degree, class. So this comes in two flavors. Flavor number one is positive, meaning you're going to reproduce with individuals who have similar traits to you. Negative would be you're going to reproduce with people who have very dissimilar traits to you. Both of these happen with humans. Positive assortative mating amongst humans include how educated you are. Doctors marry doctors. Doctors tend not to marry high school dropouts. There is a pattern. There is evidence behind BMI correlation. Individuals with higher BMI are attracted to people with higher BMI and lower with lower. There's also a very interesting one, which is why it's pointing it out, is if you are Latine, you prefer Latine. It's not true with other groups, but with them, it is positively correlated. Don't believe me? There's the article. So, and it doesn't matter if you go wife or husband. And they tend to be, and it doesn't matter where we look, we get the same sets of patterns. So we see this pattern if we look in the Bay Area, we'll see the pattern if we look in Mexico City, go to Puerto Rico, go to New York, we get the same pattern around here. They prefer similarities. Does that mean all do? Of course not. It's not a perfect one-to-one -one correlation. But it's there. Here's the weird one. There's a negative correlation amongst your MHCs. MHC stands for the Major Histocompatibility Complex. It's one of the markers that say, I am me. And we only have so many versions of this. The pickiness comes from women. Where sometimes it's just a, yeah, yeah, I just, I just don't feel it with him. Like there's just something off. Don't know what it is, but yeah, it's just not working. One of the things that we think is the case is you can smell. You can smell that there's a difference, that, or not a difference, excuse me, that you're too genetically similar in terms of your immune profiles. That's not all of them. Yeah, there's something off. We're pretty sure that smell, because you do have better senses of smell than us. But it's a, if you end up choosing to mate with someone who has very similar immune profiles, you're decreasing 
the immune fitness of your children. And you probably care more about the child than the guy does. Which, why that is, that's a different argument and a different story. But you're looking out and caring about that a little more in the forefront than he is. So it's just a, hmm, interesting. Another version of this is referred to as a population structure. So population structure is you make where you are. You're stuck, and that's what you get. What this will end up doing is increasing the odds of you becoming homozygous. We have seen this kind of, sort of, already when we dealt with Migration, but we chose to not integrate the populations. We kept them separated from each other. This is the bigger version of that weird phenomenon with gene flow. So an example of this deals with Kansas City sunflowers. So here's just some data. So in these three locations in Kansas, so Kansas City, Hutchinson, and Elkhart, if you were to sample sunflowers and you were to look at allele frequencies, what you could see is in Kansas City, it's going to be 81 who are homozygous, 18 who are heterozygous, one who's the other homozygous. If you look at this, you could actually calculate out allele frequencies. If I were to do this for P and Q, you can get a 0.9 and a 0.1. In Hutchinson, so we move further away. If you calculate the P and Qs, it turns out to be 0.5 and 0.5. If we look at Elkhart, it's going to be 0.1 and 0.9. So we have a variety where we happen to have more dominant alleles to the east, fewer dominant alleles as we move to the west. Okay, got it. If I were to look at this as a state, so just take all three independent observations and let's just figure out what we see there. Well, if I were to do that, what I would just do is add up the observations. So 81 plus 25 plus 1 gets you 107. 1 plus 25 plus 81 gets you 107. 18 plus 18 plus 50 gets you 86. That's for the entirety of the state. And if you were to sit there and then say, well, what would I expect to see? Well, what I would expect to see is I wouldn't look at breaking up into these three chunks. What we would be inclined to do is say, let's take the average. So if I take 0 0.9, 0 0.1, and 0.5, add it up and divide by three, you get 0.5. average p-value is going to be 0.5. The average q-value will then be 0.5. If I add these up, I have 300 observations. So if I were to take p squared times 300, that would give me my expected number of homozygotes. So let's do that. So it's going to be 0.5 squared times 300. That's going to be 0.25 times 300. That's going to be 75. By logic and symmetry, oh, I push that up so it's easier for you to see it. Sorry. So by symmetry, if this is 0.5, then or this is based upon 0.5, and this should also be the same thing. So these two are both 75. Logic. So if I have a total of 300, 75, 75 is 150. 300 minus 150 is 150. So the middle should be 150. I could verify that. It'd just be 2PQ times 300. If you do that, PQ is going to be 0.25 times 2 is 0.5. So yeah, half of 300 is 150. I'm not going to do it, 
if you ran the chi-square, what are you thinking? Is that p-value going to be greater than or less than 0.05? I'd be willing to wager a donut that it'll be less than 0.05. This sucker is not matching an equilibrium, meaning this entire population is intermingling, which means something else is stopping it. In this particular case, you're breeding within your isolated areas, meaning sunflowers and Elkhart they reproduce around with those sunflowers. In Hutchinson, they reproduce with the sunflowers of Hutchinson. The sunflowers of Kansas City reproduce with the sunflowers of Kansas City. That leaves one last type. Oh, we'll do this one first, sorry. So this problem here is very similar to ones that we've already dealt with. It just looks different. So sand crabs are found up and down the California coast, and they have population structure, meaning they reproduce in their isolated areas. They don't wander around. Population in Huntington Beach is analyzed for a SNP. The frequency of Cs is 0.8. The frequency of Ts is 0.2. So in Huntington Beach, the frequency of C is 0.8. Frequency of T is 0.2. They're also looking at Santa Cruz. Ooh, we traveled. Uh, C's and T's are 0.5. Okay. There's 100,000 sand crabs in each population. How many more homozygotes do you, would you observe if the, if the population, or would you observe compared to a population in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? So what we have to do is do the problem twice. What I'm going to do is figure out the number of cc's here. This is part one. Part two is going to be I'm going to combine the populations to then find out the number of cc's. So that's how these problems work. When you ask how many more, you have to run the calculation twice. Okay. Well, CC, well, C is 0.8, so it'd be 100,000, because if you remember, we're told there's 100,000 in each, times 0.8 squared. Then this one here on the right would be 100,000 times 0.5 squared. But when you do that, you're going to get 64,000 on the left. We'll get 25,000 on the right. If their power is combined, I'm going to get... 89,000 crabs this way. Not hard. We got this. We could do this. What I'm now going to do is I'm going to blend them together. So I'm going to have an average value. So my average C value and an average T. Well, the populations are equal, 100,000, 100,000. Okay, so I just need to add them up and divide by 2. 0. 0.8 plus 0. 0.5 is 1.3. 1.3 divided by 2 is 0. 0.65. Which means this one here is going to be 0. 0.35. I just repeat the calculation. It be 0. 0.65 squared times, what's my population? 200,000. You multiply that out, you get 84,500. Those two numbers don't match. And in fact, there are 4,500 more with population structure. The last option that we have is inbreeding. Okay. 
squared which? 0.65. Take those, add them up, divide by 2. Get 0.65. So when it comes to mating with family, you have two choices. You say yes to your cousin, or you say you no, and you run away from your cousin. If you say yes to the cousin, we call that inbreeding. If you look at family and you run away, run away, run away, we call that outbreeding. Both examples exist. So inbreeding is going to increase the odds of homozygosity, whereas outbreeding will decrease the odds. So that I mean, makes sense. So let's make that happen. Easiest way to do this is with yourself. Plants can inbreed, but they don't need another plant. They just need themselves because plants can self-fertilize. They can self-pollinate. Well, some plants can do this. Some plants are intolerant of it, which means they only outbreed. They do not inbreed. But there are some plants that are perfectly okay with it. This is only going to be possible in plants that are called monaceous. So a monaceous plant is one that has what we call a complete flower, meaning there's male and female reproductive parts. There are plants that, have, that produce flowers where there's a male version and there's a female version. This obviously doesn't apply to them. This only applies to the ones that have everything in the flower. The catch is they can only self cross so many times before the plant dies. It's un incapable of maintaining itself. So you can't self-cross for perpetuity. At some point, you need to introduce new genetics or it's done for. How does this work? A population of self-fertilizing plants has a frequency of the dominant allele of being 0.8. What is the frequency of the heterozygote after 10 generations of this inbreeding? And what are the approximate values of the two homozygotes? So, the way we have to think of this is every time it crosses itself, what we're going to do is kick out some of its homozygosity or heterozygosity. They're going to lose heterozygosity. And it's going to lose stuff at the rate of a half. So it's going to be losing half each time. So all I have to do is repeat this halving, losing of those halves, for 10 generations. Well, I don't want to draw all that out. That sounds like too much work. So what I can say is that's definitely one half to the tenth power. Actually, sorry. I wrote half there. It actually should be a quarter. The reason why it's a quarter is because you can, when you do your Punnett square, you can lose a quarter because you have two options for being a heterozygote. So you can lose a quarter on one side, a quarter on the other. So I can just do this 10 times. So it's a half, because if you add these two up, quarter, quarter, you get a half. I just do it 10 times. The catch is, what did I start at? I need to know what this thing was to begin with. How could we figure out what it was to begin with? Well, if I'm dealing with a heterozygous plant, let's assume that it's starting as being heterozygous, because it's the only way it's, this is going to work. So what is the odds of it being a heterozygous plant? Well, it's going to be 2PQ. Oh, 
oh, there's a two there, so let's knock one of those off. There's going to be PQ times one half to the ninth power. So if I just plug in the numbers, 0 0.8 times 0 0.2 over 2 to the ninth. 2 to the ninth is 512. 0 0.8 times 0 0.2 is 0 0.16. So if you divide that out, you're going to get 3.125 times 10 to the minus fourth. Which is pretty close to zero. It's not zero, but it's, that's pretty good. So the question is, so here's the allele frequency after 10 generations. So what are the approximate values for the dominant alleles, for the dominant phenotypes, the dominant and the recessive phenotype? Helps if I can speak. Well, we effectively went, if you think of this, from being 0.32 to zero. That's basically what we did. And it was divided equally up. So 0.16 to one side, 0.16 to the other. Well, what are the odds of you starting off homozygous? You start off as being 0.8 squared. And the odds of you starting off homozygous recessive was 0.2 squared. We add those up, 0.8 squared is 0.64. We're going to add 0.16 to it. What does that get you? 0 0.8. 0.04 plus 0.16 will get you 0.2. The allele frequency converges onto the genotype frequency. Which is a nice way of saying a total shutdown of all diversity. You are in one camp or you're in the other. And it only took 10 generations. Which for a plant could be two years. Depends on the plant. So inbreeding can result in a dramatic loss of or heterozygosity really fast. With humans, we try and make this a little easier for us. And we do it by talking about the odds of something showing up. We call that the inbreeding ratio of F. And basically, our version of this equation is going to be how many more times likely is a homozygous individual to result from inbreeding than from random mating? How would this, or what would we... The odds of random breeding, if P equals 0.01, odds of random breeding is one in a million, we get it. So what if it's done by inbreeding? So let's make it simple. Parents, let's give them two children. Oh, so I write that correctly. They have two children. Their children say, ooh la la, and they want to have a child. So what are the odds of this showing up? Well, the odds of, well, I need to actually consider two different cases. Case number one is this parent here is the carrier. So then we need to have one half odds of it being passed on, and then we have half odds of it being passed on. This is assuming this individual is heterozygous. Well, what are the odds of that person being heterozygous? 2PQ. That'd be the odds of that person being heterozygous. So I guess from that red path, it's 2PQ times a half to the fourth power, which I guess if we cross those off, that's PQ times a half to the third power. Oh, so that's it. There's a problem with this. What if I pick the wrong parent? 
which means I need to consider it with this individual being the source then passing it on 2pq times a half to the fourth power cancel cancel pq third so which option is it the answer is we don't know so I guess we have to add them up so if I add them up that's gonna get me 2pq the third oh sweet I can do that so this is just gonna get me PQ over 4 okay well P is 0 0.001 Q then is 0.999 and I just divide by 4 what I'm gonna get is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 4 my F ratio is going to be 2.5 times 10 to the minus 4. This is the inbreed. I'm going to compare that with the random, which was 1 out of a million. You plug that in. The answer is 250. In English, this inbreeding scenario increases the likelihood of you getting this disorder 250 times compared to normal. And that's assuming, for the sake of saying it, that these two are just statistically average. What if one of them is the product of inbreeding? Because if one of them is the product of inbreeding, the, this number here, just got a lot bigger because we've increased the likelihood of one of them starting off as being inbred. So this is the portion that we're just finishing up, you know, obviously online, because time is time. So related to the inbreeding ratio is something called the inbreeding coefficient, which is Fi, so this ratio based upon um, inbreeding. This is its generic formula. So it's going to be the sum of all of these things that we call loops. It's going to be based on 1 half to the nth power multiplied by 1 plus what we would call this FA. FA is what we call the ancestor inbreeding. So this is you have a loop and the top involves an inbred person. So we can show how this works if we do it for like siblings or what have you. And we could then derive this formula. So if we had what we had before, which is this, what we ended up saying was there were two pathways. So we had this being an inbreeding situation. And what we could also have is this being an inbreeding situation. If I look at it, this green one here has three individuals. So that'd be one half to the third. This one, one over here, has three individuals, which is one half to the third. The odds of this individual down here getting it is obviously one-fourth. We're going to take all that into consideration. So the sum turns out to be one-half, again, to the n times one plus fa. Well, I don't, if there's no one inbreeding to begin with, so if these two people here aren't inbred, then it's a zero, so it doesn't matter. So what do we get? We're going to get one half to the third power plus one half to the third power which when you add those up will get you one half squared and if you look that number there that one fourth 
is that one right there. So I can do all of this ex explanation stuff and have to try and figure out how things work, or I can just use these loops. So how does this work? So if we did siblings, what we have? Fi, if you recall, is one fourth. So if I want to figure out the odds of an inbred, it would actually be 4pq times a fourth times fi. Those cancel out. So it's going to be pq fi, which was pq divided by 4. And that's exactly what we did. Interesting. So let's make this easier. First cousins. So if we were to do this for first cousins, we'd have the grandparents. We have the first generation. These are going to give you first cousins right here. Well, how does this work? Again, I have two ways that I can make this inbreeding work. I have loop number one. I have loop number two. In both cases, it's going to be... If you look at it, one, they each have five, so it's going to be one half to the fifth plus one half to the fifth. And that's going to give me one half to the fourth, which is a sixteenth. So the odds of P squared would just be PQ divided by 16. If I go with a second cousin, Hopefully what you'll catch on to really fast is there is a predictable pattern as long as we maintain symmetry. So if I have this situation, again, we can go That one there has seven individuals, seven individuals. So what we'll get is one half to the seventh plus one half to the seventh. That's going to add up to being one half to the sixth. Have you picked up on the pattern yet? Squared, fourth, sixth. If you were to multiply that out, You're going to get a 64th. So the odds of P squared will be PQ over 64. So it's actually rather quick. As long as we have a drawing, all we have to do is figure out what my loops are and invoke them. Based upon this value here, we can actually predict what's going to go on in the next generation. So in terms of what's going to go on with the next generation in terms of homozygotes, who are uh, homozygous for A1, it's going to be P squared plus that little bump that they get. If I look at it for being heterozygous, it's going to be Q squared plus that bump that we got. And if you recall, this right here are these values right here. So it's that increase in the odds due to inbreeding. So if I wanted to know what it would be, if you're heterozygous, it's going to be 2pq, because that's the odds. But I need to subtract out both of these. So that's why it's minus 2pq. Why do we have a positive value for f? It's always because it's inbreeding. So it actually makes predicting these things pretty simple. So the p-value for inherited disease is going to be 0 0.002. Two cousins are considering marriage. So let's call these first cousins, because typically if you say cousins, we mean first cousins. What's the inbreeding coefficient for this disease? Well, that one I already remember, because I calculated it already. It's 1 over 16. See, we have it right here. There's fi. 
What is the inbreeding ratio? Well, the inbreeding ratio would be PQ over 16 divided by P squared. So if I were to go through and do that, it's 0 0.002 times 0.998 divided by 16. And all that's going to be divided by 0 0.002 squared. What that will get you is going to be... 1.2475 times 10 to the minus 4 divided by 4 times 10 to the minus 6. And that's going to get you 31.19. So let's make this allele frequency 10 times higher. So we're going to repeat this. But instead of it being 0.02, we're going to do it as 0.02 times 0 0.98 out of 16 divided by 0 0.02 quantity squared. When you do that, what you're going to ultimately get is 3.0625. And you look at this and you say, oh, well, that's not as, as big of a change. This is a more common event since P is not as rare, which makes sense. Outbreeding, which is obviously not inbreeding, is going to increase diversity. So this is going to try and limit the number of homozygous loci. And we do this usually through behavior. So a good example of this is cardiocondyla elegans, which are some type of ant. What they actually do is they remove queens from their nest and they deposit the queen at a different nest, at a foreign nest. When you look at this figure, a gain means a future queen. So what we see in this figure is as we look at the relatedness of the gain to the carrier, you'll notice that the carriers are always related. But when we look at where the queen is compared to the colonies, they actually segregate. And we should probably do this in different colors. So I have one cluster up here and a cluster on the bottom. What we tend to see is she's moved to an unrelated area. What we'll see is she doesn't stick around. which when you look at all this, eventually you get to that conclusion, but it's like you have to mull it over in your head. It's, it's a very confusing picture. So that's the end of the class. Um, genetics exists and science exists in a political sphere. They say that if you mix science and politics, you get politics. And science isn't personal, yet it really is kind of personal because you have to talk about where funding comes from and who decides the funding and if there's a rivalry across labs or universities or different countries. So the result is like we have problems with how things work. Also, the funding has to come through political appointment. So science has to follow the game of politics and be influenced by the game of politics. Whether that's right or wrong is a different question. Hopefully throughout the semester you saw that genetics is not simple. And that's namely because life is not easy to understand. Genetics is hard and there's no point in saying it's not. And we do simplify a lot in this class to make it easier for you and for me to understand. But the problem is that doesn't make that our simplification the truth. There's a lot more going on than what we talk about in here. And we know that life is complicated and we know that and we can't say oh it's all because of genetics because here are a whole bunch of things where we like to talk about what's going on with genetics and it's just not simple we can like how does genetics apply to race well that's difficult because race is made up how about gender i don't know that's kind of difficult because it's kind of made up how about with sex well we want it to be binary but all the evidence is saying sorry it's not 
intelligence, good luck. You can't CRISPR Cas9 your way into higher intelligence on that one. How about avoiding cancer? Good luck with that. What's neurodivergence? I don't know. What about sexual orientation? What about vaccination? What's going on with gene editing? Like it's, it's complicated. It's just complicated. One of the things that we can say is Africa is the most diverse continent on Earth. And even then, they're not that diverse. We people are genetically basically siblings. We are very, very, very similar to each other. And it'd just be nice if we treated each other as such. So Monday, we're going to do an in-class review. Obviously, if you're not going to be there, you're not going to be there. I will uh, host it on Zoom. So if you wish to watch and follow along, hooray. I then don't see you for a week. We have the last possible final at 10.15. Um, Prom set 10 or 14 is going to be posted. I will have a guided office hour video. Their graders aren't doing anything with this. Um, Prom set 14 is fair game on your final, so don't blow it off. Just saying.